Welcome to The Blind Side. News and information from a blindness perspective. Here's Jonathan Moser. Thanks for being with us once again. Really appreciate all the positive feedback. And if you are enjoying what you're hearing, I would really appreciate it if you would take some time to give us a review in Apple Podcasts or iTunes. Apple Podcasts, if you're using it on your iDevice, iTunes, if you're using it on your PC or Mac. It does make a difference to how easy it is to find us and how things go with the rankings. If you wouldn't mind giving us a nice positive five-star review, I would really appreciate that. It only takes a couple of minutes, but it makes the world of difference to us trying to get the word out about all the news and current affairs and information and technology that we're bringing you free here on The Blind Side. And boy, are we being prolific at the moment because here we are with episode 54, and by the end of the week... We anticipate having published episode 55, it's true. And the reason for that is that my wife, Bonnie, was doing a lot of prevaricating and prognosticating and procrastinating and debating and generally going all over the place about will she or won't she get an iPhone 8 Plus? What normally happens here in our family is that we have this cycle where I have to get the new iPhone for business purposes and It's like the the good old-fashioned trickle-down, you know, like they used to talk about in the 90s. (laughs) And so generally Bonnie gets the last year's phone and the kids get Bonnie's and, and on and on it goes. But Bonnie's getting a new phone and she deserves a new phone. And I decided to get the Apple Watch. I am hanging out for the iPhone 10 because I've got to complete iOS 11 without the i second edition. There is a chapter in the book already, and thank you if you've bought the book already. A lot of people have, and I'm very grateful for all the positive feedback. So there is a chapter on the iPhone 10 already, which talks about some of the new voiceover gestures and Face ID and how it works in a blindness context. It's great that Apple have thought about this. But There's nothing quite like having your hands on and expanding that book based on hands on experience. And I have some other training that is related to the iPhone 10 as well in a Mosin consulting capacity. So the iPhone 10 is a business expense and I will be getting that. Bonnie's getting the phone at the end of the week, the iPhone 8 Plus. I've got the watch and we will be having a look at how responsive it is, how Siri works now that it can speak on the Apple Watch. And I'm hoping for a better speaker on the Apple Watch, just even fractionally better. And I called Apple and I said, are you going to give us a better speaker on the Apple Watch? And they didn't actually know. They didn't have any data on that. So I suspect if they're not touting it as a feature, the answer is probably no. But we're going to unbox it. Bonnie says she wants to unbox her own iPhone. How unreasonable is this? So Bonnie will be here in the studio unboxing her own iPhone with me. Uh, I'll be setting it up because Bonnie's asked if I could set it up, and I'm happy to do that. And we'll be unboxing the Apple Watch. So Friday comes around in New Zealand before most places, and that means that we will have the iPhone 8 Plus and the Apple Watch before it lands in most parts of the world. We're going to do nothing else but concentrate on doing the unboxing, setting it up, and getting that podcast recorded and ready for you. So chances are you will hear that podcast before it's possible in many parts of the world to even get the iPhone 8 Plus or the Apple Watch Series 3. But the reason why I'm here with this episode of the podcast is that I've just finished a presentation, which I have permission to share with you. Every so often I get asked by the people at Accessible World to do a Tech Talk presentation. I shudder to think how many years I've been doing these for. It's a long, long time. It goes back to a woman named Pat Price, who made a great contribution to our community. She's no longer with us. In her memory, they call the virtual room where they do these Tech Talk presentations the Pat Price Tech Talk training room. And every Monday at 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific, They get together in a talking communities conference room and they have a whole range of guest speakers talking about technology. And this is a voluntary thing. They've been doing it for years and years and it's an incredible service that they provide to the blind community. So when they ask me if I will come and talk to them about whatever they'd like me to talk to them about, I do my best to oblige and and make that contribution. So they asked if I would talk about iOS 11. And of course, as we publish this podcast, we're hours away from iOS 11's official release. So I thought that this might be of interest to many blind side listeners. And so I'm going to play for you now a recording of my part of the the formal presentation to Tech Talk 
on iOS 11. Predominantly, it focuses on accessibility-related features, specifically voiceover-related features. But we do go a little bit beyond that and talk about some things in Siri and the Control Center and a few other things. So I hope you find this useful. It is the Tech Talk iOS 11 presentation. It is always a pleasure to be back with you on Tech Talk. I am a regular here and I'm glad about that, talking about all sorts of technology. And I know there's a lot of excitement about the technology that I'm going to be talking about today, iOS 11, which as we do this webinar is coming out tomorrow. It'll come out at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, that's 10 a.m. Pacific Time in the United States, bright and early at 5 a.m. here in New Zealand. A lot of people have been testing iOS 11 in public beta form, so there will be some of you who are participating in this session who have some experience with iOS 11, and there will be others who are willing to let other people do that because it is true that some of these betas can be a bit rough around the edges, and indeed, there are still some bugs in iOS 11. Now, I'm not going to comment a lot on those bugs because although we have the golden master of iOS 11 right now, and that is probably the build that the public will guess, we can't be absolutely certain of that. It is possible that Apple may have smoothed out a couple of the more glaring bugs in iOS 11 before they do the final release. So I will leave others to comment on the bugs in iOS 11 after we confirm that there have been no changes to the Golden Master. So I'm going to take you through iOS 11, at least some of the highlights. If you want all of the details, of course, I have a book. It is called iOS 11 Without the Eye. You can get it by going to mosin.org slash iOS 11. This is the fifth year that I've done this iOS Without the Eye series. I started in 2013 with iOS 7, and we've kept the price the same all those years. It is still $19.95. The book is almost doubled in size, though, from the first one I did. It was about 27,000 words, I think, in 2013. Now it's 41,000 words. When I started on this project, I wasn't sure how many words I'd be able to put together on iOS 11 because superficially, it seemed like there wasn't a heck of a lot new. Actually, there's an awful lot that's new. And so even if you have been beta testing iOS 11, there may be things that are in there that you may not know about. So 20 bucks is a pretty small investment to make sure that you get the most out of the power that you now have in your iPhone, iPad, and iPod Touch. Wait a minute. Aren't you forgetting something? Or should I say, someone? Goodness me, they get worse every year, don't they? Yes, I probably am forgetting you. You can, you can introduce yourself if you like. I'm the new voice of Siri in iOS 11, and I'll be helping Jonathan today. Well, that's jolly decent of you. Yes, Siri does have a new voice in iOS 11, very human-like. It's probably one of the most accurate human-like text-to-speech engines ever created. And in the book, iOS 11 Without the Eye, there's a chapter on Siri in which I go into some detail about how this voice was created. Apple auditioned thousands of voices looking for just the right person with the kind of bubbly personality, but authoritative, someone who was easy to understand. And they recorded about 20 hours of audio. This woman, I don't think we know who she is yet, but she has said all sorts of phrases. She's read directions. She's read bits of audio books. And of course, you can never possibly take account of everything that a personal assistant might say. So the trick with these text-to-speech engines, which are based on real human beings, is the way that these tiny fragments, these phonemes, are strung together. As computers get faster, and there are some very fast 64-bit processes in iPhones and iPads and iPod Touches these days, it is getting easy for them to string these phonemes together in a way that makes speech sound very natural. But they've really hit it out of the park with the quality of this new American female Siri voice in iOS 11. And so we'll be using that voice today. I don't know how many people will end up using this with voiceover, but you can. It's not the most responsive text-to-speech engine on your iPhone, but people have different requirements. Some people prefer responsiveness. Other people prefer human sounding like speech. And if you are in the latter category, you are going to love this new Siri voice in iOS 11. 
let's look now at the devices that will run iOS 11. So there's no ambiguity about whether when the release drops, you will be able to get iOS 11. Of course, the iPhone 10 will run iOS 11 when it ships at the beginning of November. iOS 11 will be pre-installed on the iPhone 10. There is a chapter in iOS 11 without the eye that covers the iPhone 10. And I intend to get an iPhone 10 so that I can flesh out that chapter further. But it already covers Face ID and how a blind person can use that. There has been quite a bit of concern about whether Face ID, which is the replacement for Touch ID, where you unlock your phone and authenticate Apple Pay purchases, whether that will lock out some blind people. For example, blind people who have artificial eyes or whose eye condition makes it difficult for them to keep their eyes open. Apple tell me that they have actually thought of all of this. And when you run VoiceOver at the time of setup, which you will do by pressing the side button, where the power button used to be on the older iPhones, there's a larger button now on the iPhone 10 called the side button. And you triple tap that, and that will give you VoiceOver. You have to do that because on the iPhone 10, there's an awful lot of screen and there is no home button anymore. So all those things that people used to refer to triple click home, I guess will be triple click side instead or something like that. You triple click that button and voiceover will start right on the setup screen and take you through. Now, when you get to the setup process for Face ID, if you have an iPhone 10, it'll be sensitive to the fact that you are running voiceover. And what it will do for you is it will go in and disable a feature in accessibility settings. You double tap settings, general accessibility, face ID. Now, remember, this is only on an iPhone 10 because an iPhone 10 is the only device that has face ID. When you go in there, there's an attention mode. And essentially it asks, does face ID need to have your attention in order to authenticate, in order to unlock? If you uncheck that, which it will be by default, when you set up Face ID with VoiceOver on, then you don't need to look directly at the Face ID camera to unlock your phone. And the theory is that this should make it easy for any blind person to authenticate and unlock with Face ID. It could be argued that that does make Face ID fractionally less secure. And I suppose time will just tell about that, but at least it doesn't lock you out of the feature. So that's all been thought about. We'll talk about Face ID in much greater depth in chapter two of iOS 11 without the eye. So if you're interested in this, you should get the book and read up all about the iPhone 10 and alternative gestures and commands that you now use, given that there is no home button. So the iPhone 10 has iOS 11, naturally enough. So too does the iPhone 8 Plus and the iPhone 8. When you get that, if you're buying one and shipments are due to arrive on the 22nd of September, my wife Bonnie has an iPhone 8 Plus coming and we are going to unbox that when it arrives on the Blind Side podcast. One of the cool things about living in New Zealand is that the 22nd comes to New Zealand before it comes to most countries. So we'll unbox the new iPhone 8 Plus and the new Apple Watch and give you a bit of a tour of that on the Blind Side podcast podcast. You can look for the Blindside podcast in any good podcast app, or you can go to our website at mosen.org, that's M-O-S-E-N.org, and look for the Blindside podcast there. So iPhone 8 Plus and iPhone 8, of course, running iOS 11. Now let's look at the other devices that will run iOS 11, the existing devices out there in the market right now. There are, by my count, about 19 existing devices that will work. There's the iPad Pro 12.9-inch second generation, the iPad Pro 12.9-inch first generation, the iPad Pro 10.5-inch, the iPad Pro 9.7-inch, the iPad 2017, also known as the fifth generation, the iPad Air 2, iPad Air, iPad Mini 4, iPad Mini 3, iPad Mini 2, 
iPhone 7 Plus, iPhone 7, iPhone 6S Plus and iPhone 6S, iPhone SE, the iPhone 6 Plus, iPhone 6 and the iPhone 5S. Now in iPod Touch land, you've got the iPod Touch 6th generation that is capable of running iOS 11. These devices all have one very important thing in common, and that is that they run a 64-bit processor. iOS 11 is a very significant release from a technical standpoint for Apple because they are obsoleting all 32-bit devices. Everything in the Apple ecosystem is now 64 bits, and we explain what that means for you in iOS 11 without the eye. One thing I will comment on here, though, is what it does mean for you is that there may be some apps that you use on a regular basis that won't work anymore. This won't be news to you for the last few months in iOS 10. You've been getting warnings when you run certain apps that say, oi, unfortunately, this app is not going to be compatible with future versions of iOS. Now, this is a process that Apple has been flagging with developers for quite some years now, where they've said, we will get to a point where 32-bit versions of apps are not going to run anymore. It's more efficient this way. Uh, We're going to give you warning, and then we're going to stop supporting them. And that's what has happened now. When iOS 11 is installed, if you try and run one of these apps, it simply won't work. The app will appear on your home screen, but it isn't going to run. And you'll be able to go and have a look at a list of apps that are not compatible with iOS 11. Now, you can lobby the developer and say, look, I really like your app. I want it to be compatible with iOS 11. Can you please do something? But I think it's fair to say that given all the warning that they've had that this is coming, if they haven't updated their app by now, then they're probably not going to. Having said that, one app that I really like using is an app called Radium. It's a radio app, and it actually has a really good interface to Sirius XM, so I enjoy using it. If you're a Mac user, it also has a really nice feature where you can sync your favorites through iCloud. So a lot of benefits. And Radium hasn't been updated for a very long time. And at the 11th hour, Radium have actually submitted a 64-bit version of their app to the iTunes store. So you never know that app that you really like that you're worried about losing may well pop up in the next few days, but probably not. Another thing that you will notice has disappeared in iOS 11, somewhat strangely to me, is native support for Twitter, Facebook, and some other social media services. That means that if you use an app that relies on the built-in Facebook and Twitter sharing features, that app is going to have to find another way of doing the same thing because that has been deprecated. It really has caused me quite a bit of frustration. It also means, for example, that you can't say to Siri, post a tweet That doesn't work anymore, and I used to use that a lot. Oh, dear. Very sorry to disappoint you, Jonathan. Yes, I should think so, too. You should talk to your people at Apple about that. So I imagine that what will happen with this is that a number of other Twitter apps will come to the aid of the party, such as Twitterific and maybe the native Twitter app. Tweetings does actually have the ability to share within Tweetings. That's a third-party Twitter client. But it doesn't seem to have the ability within its little share option to select the account you want to share from if you're someone who uses multiple Twitter accounts. And I've written to the developer, and hopefully that will be addressed in future. Let's take a look at some of the accessibility changes in iOS 11, particularly the voiceover changes. To do that, I'll ask my vocal little friend here to take us there. Launch voiceover settings. Here are the voiceover settings. Settings. Accessibility. Back button. A couple of things I'd like to show you are in the speech subsection of the voiceover settings. I'm just going to flick through to get there. Swipe three. Voice speaking rate. Speaking rate. Speech. Button. This is the speech button, so we'll double tap. Voiceover. Back button. And there are a few good changes here, so we'll flick through. Speech. Edit. Voice. Alex. Pronunciations. Button. Pitch. Heading. Pitch. 50%. Adjustable. Swipe up or down with one finger to adjust the value. And here is a new pitch slider that has been introduced to iOS 11. If you have a hearing impairment or you're just particular about the way your voice sounds, you may find it helpful to adjust the pitch of the voice. So if I flick up 
60%, 70%, 80%, 90%, 100%. And we'll flip back down. 50%, 40%, 30%, 20%. 10%, 0%, and interest. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. So this is a good start. There are a couple of things to note about this. This slider is global. What I mean by that is that if you set the pitch of this particular voice, let's say to 45 or 40%, because you just prefer that a little lower, and you can imagine that working okay. 40%. Yeah, so there's 40%. Pitch, heading, pitch, 40%. Adjustable. Swipe up or down with one finger to adjust the value. It doesn't sound too bad, but I'll set it back to the default. 50%. If you have set that slider to 40% and then you change to another voice, that other voice will also inherit that 40% setting, which may not be what you want. So I have a bunch of voices on my language rotor, so I can quickly switch between voices like Daniel, the UK English voice, and... Lee, the Australian voice, which I quite enjoy. And it's handy to have that on the rotor. But when you do that, if you've lowered the pitch for the voice you've last been using, then the pitch will be lowered for all of them. And unfortunately, at this time, there is no way to adjust the pitch of the voice on VoiceOver's rotor. So every time you want to change the pitch, You've got to come in here to voiceover settings and double tap speech and locate the slider and adjust the voice. However, if you use one voice a lot of the time, which probably is the majority of people, and you like to make a bit of a tweak to the pitch, you can do that now. I'm going to perform a two finger scrub to go back to the previous screen. Speech button. And we're going to have a look for the verbosity settings. Verbosity button. Well, that didn't take long. We'll double tap this. Voiceover. Back button. There are a lot of great changes with verbosity in iOS 11, and I'm one of those efficiency ninjas that loves to make the most of features that allow me to be as productive as I can to hear the minimum amount of speech that I need. And there's a lot of good stuff here. Let's flick through. Verbosity. Speak hints. Punctuation. Some. Button. This allows you to set punctuation from VoiceOver's interface. Now, punctuation has been around for a while, but interestingly, it's only been available in VoiceOver's rotor before now. Punctuation was not actually available in verbosity settings, which is a curious omission. I suspect it was an omission, and now it has just been rectified in iOS 11. Speak detected text. On. Double tap to toggle setting. This is a setting that you'll find very useful. The one thing I do wish is that it was available on an app-by-app basis. You have probably been in a situation where, let's say you're in a podcast app, and you find yourself focused on a control, and it's constantly speaking how much time has elapsed. You know, one minute, 30 seconds, one minute, 35 seconds. And you have to move away from the control because it's jabbering on at you and you can't hear the podcast you're actually trying to listen to. This is what the speak detected text option aims to deal with. When you turn speak detected text off, the only way that you will get an update about a control that's constantly updating itself is to Take focus away from the control. In other words, flick away from the control and then flick back again. And then you'll get the updated information from the control. There will be situations where you want detected text to update in real time. For example, if you're in the Maps application, you probably want to know how close you are to your destination or if you have focus set to your estimated time of arrival, which is something I quite enjoy doing a lot when I'm in a taxi or an Uber, then it will update that ETA. So it would be really great if you could set this on a per app basis. But for now, you do have to go into verbosity settings and set this feature. It's also not available on VoiceOver's rotor. I get the impression that Apple has considered the rotor a bit busy and so they don't want to add too many new options to the rotor determines whether automatically detected text in the focused item is spoken right that's their very succinct explanation of the feature i just described we'll continue to flick right capital letters play sound button this is a really good feature and it's similar to what you see in voiceover on the mac so you can choose 
a whole bunch of options for a whole bunch of things that we're going to see. The first one is what happens when VoiceOver encounters an uppercase letter, a capital letter. So I'll double tap and show you what we have. Verbosity. Back button. We'll flick right. Capital letters. Headache. Speak cap. It will speak the word cap. Selected. Play sound. Change pitch. Do nothing. You can even have it do nothing. So there's something for everyone here. If you want it to say the word cap, if you want it to change the pitch when it encounters a capital letter or play a little sound. The sound is quite subtle and it's the same sound that voiceover on the Mac emits when it encounters a capital letter if you have this setting enabled. So it's good to see this here. And indeed, there is quite a bit this time that is carried over from the Mac to voiceover in iOS. And I think that has probably been inspired by the fact that the iPad in general is a lot more Mac-like. And I've got a whole chapter on this. But essentially, when the iPad Pro came out, Tim Cook made the bold statement that maybe you don't need a computer anymore. The iPad does everything that you need it to do in most cases. And a lot of people said, not so fast, Tim. And there's a whole bunch of things in iOS 11 that has really responded to those comments from users who have said the iPad's not quite there yet as a computer replacement. Now, as a result of all of that thinking, they have boosted voiceover in a whole bunch of ways, including borrowing a bunch of great features from the Mac. Well, flick to the right. Do nothing. Well, I need to get out of this time by doing a two-finger scrub. Change pitch. Capital letters. Deleting text. Play sound. Button. And we've got the same series of options for deleting text. What happens when you press backspace or otherwise delete text? And it plays a slightly different sound when you're deleting text from the sound that you would hear when you get uppercase letters. Embedded links. Play sound. Button. Embedded links are all over the place. You will find them on web pages. You'll sometimes find them in email messages and PDF documents. So these are links that you can double tap on and have something happen. And as you can hear, I like the play sound option. I want minimal verbosity without compromising access to the information I need. So the fact that these sounds are all subtly different and you can get used to the sound, it speeds you up because you don't have to hear the word cap or link all the time. So... I'm really a fan of what they've done here. Table output. Heading. This gives you greater control over what is said when you're in a table. iOS 10 introduced a bunch of new verbosity features that made voiceover more table sensitive. But unfortunately, some developers use tables in the wrong way. They use them for decorative purposes rather than for formatting information that makes sense in a tabular form. And so now you have greater control over the way that tables are verbalized. More details on this in iOS 11 without the eye. I'm going to go to the bottom of the screen and show you one really cool thing. Determined media descriptions. Speech. Button. This is a feature called Media Description, and this is just so cool, and it has all sorts of positive implications for many people. Let's double tap this button. Verbosity. Back button. And flick to the right. Media Descriptions. Heading. Off. Selected. Speech. Braille. Speech and Braille. Determines how closed captions plus SDH are output during media playback. What's this feature for? Well, let's say that you have a sighted significant other and they are really interested in watching a film that is not in the language you speak. So since we are probably English speakers here, uh, that's not in English. It might be a film in French and it has English subtitles. So your significant other wants to watch this movie. In the past, it would be really difficult to follow that movie. It could spoil it for your significant other if they have to explain what's going on and read the subtitles. Or what if you have a hearing impairment and you can hear the voice of an audio describer clearly enough, but you would like to be able to get extra information about the dialogue because the speech tends to be a bit faster in the dialogue. You know, an actor's mumble and they're talking fast and excitedly and you're just finding that a bit difficult to catch. So there are a couple of scenarios where this feature is useful. 
what happens is that you can go into any app that supports subtitles or captions. Netflix will. Many iTunes movies are subtitled as well, have, have captions. And you can enable the feature just as a sighted person would. You have to make sure that the feature is enabled in the app in question. Then you can go and set the feature up in a way that makes sense for you. This screen determines where the subtitles get output to. You can switch them off altogether. You can have the output going just to your Braille display, which is ideal if you are listening to a movie, maybe with headphones or on your Apple TV, because it works the same way in TVOS as well, and you have a Braille display and you just want to read the captions. Also, if you have a hearing impairment and you are watching with a family member, it's great because your family member doesn't have to hear voiceover on an Apple TV blasting out the subtitles, but you can read them on the Braille display. They scroll by. You can also have your subtitles going to your text-to-speech engine that's selected in voiceover, or you can have it sent to both your speech and Braille. You don't have to go in here to change this. When iOS detects that you are running an app that is offering subtitles, a rotor choice will appear called media descriptions. You can just use the rotor gesture, the twisting gesture like with two fingers, like you're twisting a dial on a telephone or a radio. And then you can flick up and down to move through the different options that you have. We'll do a couple of two finger scrubs here. Media descriptions. Speech. Now we're back on the verbosity screen, so we'll go back one more. Accessibility. Back button. And we're on voiceover settings again. Let me revisit this question of Mac-like behavior at this point, because there are some keyboard commands that have come down from the Mac world to iOS 11. So if you work with a Bluetooth keyboard with your iPhone, you'll have some great new commands. If you're a Mac user, you'll be right at home with these commands because they are exactly the same. They involve pressing the VO key. Now, remember, if you are using a Bluetooth keyboard, the VO key could be holding down the control and option key, or it could be holding down the caps lock key that's configurable in voiceover's settings. If you press VO with L, that speaks the current line. If you press VO with W, it will speak the current word. And when you press VO with W twice quickly, it will spell the current word. If you press it three times quickly, it'll spell the current word phonetically, alpha, bravo, charlie, etc. If you press VO with C, it'll speak the current character. So you see the mnemonics here, L for line, W for word, and C for character. That works when you're in an edit field. If you press VO with J, that jumps to related items. This is also available via a new gesture. That's a two finger flick to the right. VO with semicolon toggles the lock of the VO key. And when that's on, it isn't necessary to press either of the VO modifiers to perform VO functions. With QuickNav, I'm not sure how often people will use that. Some voiceover commands have been assigned to function keys as well. Now, these may or may not work depending on your keyboard. Some keyboards, of course, use the function keys for their own purposes, like pressing the home button or invoking Siri. And sometimes you can hold down a function key with a Bluetooth keyboard that does that to get the original purpose of those keys. VO with F3 reads the item summary, and that's the same as performing a three-finger tap. VO with F4 reads the keyboard-focused item summary. VO with F6 will read the selected text, which is handy. VO F8 opens the voiceover settings. Great way to quickly get to your voiceover settings when you need to. And that, of course, has come right from the Mac. And also from the Mac, VO with F11 toggles the screen curtain on and off. There are a number of new rotor items that appear dynamically as they need to. And one of those is the ability to navigate between misspelled words. If you're composing something and you need to make sure it's looking good, then you can use the rotor gesture to find misspelled words. It does appear in most edit fields. 
and you can flick up and down through those misspellings. Unfortunately, there's no easy way really to correct your spelling, and I'll cover strategies for dealing with that in iOS 11 without the I. A theme that you'll see coming up a lot in iOS 11 is support for drag and drop. And in the iPad, it's pretty powerful. Because of the extra screen real estate you have on an iPad, you can do things like have an email message open and also have the Files app open. Yep, there's a new Files app, which is very powerful in iOS 11. It's kind of like File Explorer in Windows. You can't freely browse to system files, but you can browse to most other places where you have data stored. And in the iPad, you can simply do something like drag a file from the Files app to your open message and attach it to an email. So it's it's pretty slick. In an iPhone or an iPod Touch, drag and drop is confined to the application that you're using. But dragging and dropping, which is also fully accessible, of course, has also given cause for the VO people to change once again the paradigm for moving apps around your home screen. I do wish that there was an easy way from the rotor to get into this move mode because it can be a bit confusing for people in my experience. But once you're there, it's really very cool and much more powerful even than what we had before. So I'm going to give you a demonstration of moving apps around in iOS 11. So I'll press the home button. Messages. And I have a whole bunch of apps that are not in folders yet. I'm a bit of a neat freak, so I tend to group my apps into folders. But I have got a few new ones. We'll go to the screen here. Page three of four. Ooh. Page four of four. Com. Pavan apps. Be my ease. Easier eater. Recently updated. Double tap to open. Let's say that I want to move Easy Reader, which is a fairly new blindness-related app from Dolphin. So I'm going to double tap and hold. Started editing. And VoiceOver confirms started editing. Now, there's something you need to be aware of here. If you don't take any action within about 30 seconds, the editing mode switches off again. So I'm going to move quickly here and just do something with the screen. Eat now. Easy Reader. There's Easy Reader. And I want to indicate that I want to move this app. So I'm going to flick down. Drag Easy Reader. And we've got Drag Easy Reader. Activate. Drag Easy Reader. And activate. That's what we have for now. So I'm going to double tap. Finish editing. Oh, see what happened? You see, it times out after a while. So get used to that. We'll get back into edit mode. Started editing. Activate. Drag Easy Reader. I'll double tap. Because I have indicated that I am dragging one app, I have a whole bunch of options when I go to another app. I'm going to find another blindness-related app. Eat now. Energy online. Nearby Explorer is editing. Beta. Double tap to add to drag. Drops available. Swipe up or down to select a custom action, then double tap to activate. A lot of good hint information there, so I'm going to double tap to add to drag. Dragging two items. Files. Is editing. Now I have two blindness-related apps that I've indicated I want to move somewhere. Seeing AI. Is editing. Double tap to add to drag. Drops available. Actions available. Here's Seeing AI, which is another blindness-related app, so I'll double-tap to add it as well. Dragging three items. Manage my health. Is editing. Now I have three blindness-related apps. Three blind mice. No, three, three blindness-related apps that I want to move into my blindness folder. So I'm going to perform a three-finger flick to the right to get to the page of my home screen that has my blindness folder. Page three of five. Blindness folder. Is editing. 14 apps. Double tap to add to drag. So you can also drag a whole folder if you want, but I don't. I want to actually drop these three apps that I've already got here to this folder. So let's flick down. Add to drag session. Drop seeing AI, easier reader, nearby explorer before blindness folder. Drop ready. I don't want to do that. I don't want to drop these apps before the folder. I want to put them in the folder. So I'll keep flicking down. Drop seeing AI, easier reader. Nearby Explorer after Blindness folder. Drop ready. Don't want to do that either. Add Seeing AI, Easier Reader. Nearby Explorer to Blindness folder. Drop ready. That's what I want to do. I'll double tap. Off Blindness folder folder. Row minus one. Column minus one. 
Now, there's a bit of weird verbosity going on there. But 17 let, apps. There we go. You remember that before that drag and drop session, it said that the blindness folder had 14 apps in it. Now, it has just said that the blindness folder has 17 apps in it. And that's correct because we just added three blindness related apps to the blindness folder. So as you can appreciate, moving a whole bunch of apps, you know, you've gone to the app store, you like to group everything into folders, but you've been a bit busy and they've just accumulated all over your home screen. And now it's time to do a tidy up. That process of tidying up. Finish is, editing. Yeah, there we go. It's timed out on me again. That process of tidying up is far easier now than it has ever been before. The next thing I want to talk about in the context of accessibility is the three-finger tap. There is actually a gesture in iOS called the magic tap. And this is the two-finger double tap that many of us are familiar with. It's the one that starts and stops music playing and answers and hangs up a phone call and does a whole bunch of stuff. Well, I think that the three-finger single tap is rivaling the two-finger double tap for its magicness because it does a lot more in iOS 11. You can get a lot more font and formatting information. But also, there is a technology in iOS 11 which seeks to describe images, even to the extent that in some cases it will have a go at reading the text that is in an image. I found at least that I need to ensure that my screen curtain is off for this feature to work. Brightness doesn't seem to impact it, but whether screen curtain is on or off does. So have a go at it yourself. This could be something that is, is being tweaked. But for the moment, I have found that I get better results with screen curtain off. If you are sensitive about your privacy, just remember to switch screen curtain back on again when you're done. If you have screen curtain on and you try and focus an image and then do a three finger tap, then you may be told that the image is blurry and not be given any useful information. So the way this works is if you find an image on social media, somewhere like Twitter, and you want to find out what it is, uh, flick to the image. So voiceover will say image, perform a three finger single tap, and it will have a go at describing it. I must say that I have found the results that I get from seeing AI, the app from Microsoft, which I have been on Tech Talk before to talk about, better in a lot of cases. But the three finger single tap, which is using a new technology in iOS 11 called Core ML to do a lot of this magic, that is very quick. So what I often do is try the three finger tap in iOS 11 first to determine whether there is information here that I'm interested in. Sometimes iOS 11 gives me all I need. If it doesn't, if it doesn't read me the full text, for example, then I will take extra time to send it to seeing AI, let it do its processing, and normally I get the information I need. Although there are some rough edges right now, I have to say I am super impressed with what Apple has done with Braille in iOS 11. I'm sure that some of those rough edges will be smoothed out over the iOS 11 release cycle. But as I look at the feature set of Braille in iOS 11, it's clear that they have worked with somebody or some people who understand Braille. At a basic level, there's just a couple of really nice things that they have done that makes Braille more like Braille and other screen readers. It is no longer necessary to press space with dot seven or space with dot eight to do backspace and enter. So you can just press dot seven and dot eight, and that's certainly appreciated. What I'm going to do now is uh, oop, we'll ask Siri to get us to the Braille settings. Can it go straight to Braille settings? Open Braille settings. Here are your iPhone settings. No, I can't do that. So open voiceover settings. Here are the voiceover settings. And accessibility. All right. Back audio. There's audio. So I believe I need to flick left. Braille. Focus 40 BTE 8D 722 D1. Button. There's my focus Braille display. And in the studio here, I use a 40 cell Braille display. So I'll double tap. Voiceover. Back button. One thing you'll be able to read about in great detail in the book is that there are now two status cells which convey all sorts of information 
textual and um, other syntactical information. And I give you detailed descriptions about how those status cells work in iOS 11 without the eye. But what I really want to show you now, we'll go to the bottom of the screen. More info. Button. What used to happen in iOS 10 was that if you double tapped this more info button, so you would have selected. Focus 40 BTE 8D. You'd have your Braille display and then you'd have a more info button. And when you double tapped that more info button, all you really got was the ability to unpair your Braille display. So all of these changes are easy to miss because they're hidden away in this more info button where you think all you're going to get is the option to unpair your display. There is so much more here. And let me show you. More info. Braille. Back button. Flick right. Focus 40 BTE 8D, 720 Braille commands, button. And here's where the magic happens. This is a button called Braille commands, and I'm going to double tap this. Focus 40 BTE 8D, 722 D1, back button. And flick to the right. Braille commands, heading, Braille, button, device, button, interaction, button, keyboard, button, navigation. Button. Rotor. Button. Voiceover. Button. Reset all Braille keys assignments. Button. This is absolutely phenomenal. And this actually gives Braille users more configurability than non-Braille users because all of the commands, all of the functions that the buttons on your Braille display perform are now configurable. They're divided into very logical categories. So if I go back to the top of the screen by performing a four-finger single tap towards its top. Focus 40 BTE 8D, 700. Braille command. Braille. Button. I'll double tap the Braille button. Braille commands. Back button. And now I'll flick right and you'll see a series of commands here. Braille. Heading. Next input mode. Button. Next output mode. Button. Pen left. Button. Pan right. Button. When I discovered this feature, this was the first thing that I changed, pan left and pan right, because I'm one of those people who, when I'm setting up JAWS, the first thing I say when I go through the JAWS startup wizard, there's an option there that says reverse panning buttons when you get to the Braille section of the JAWS startup wizard. I always check that box so that the left hand panning button on my focus pans me forward and the right hand panning button pans me back. I'm a really fast Braille reader, and I find that that suits my style. But you can configure all of these things. If there are keys assigned to functions you never use, you can unassign the keys and assign them to something else. If you get horribly confused, as you saw, there's a reset button, so you can nuke all of your changes and go back to Apple's defaults. If you unpair your Braille display and repair it at a later time, then all of those settings are in fact retained. So simply unpairing the display does not cause all of your customization to disappear. However, at this point, it seems that the Braille settings don't sync in iCloud. Like, for example, the pronunciation dictionary in iOS 10 that was introduced in iOS 10 does. So that means if you have multiple iDevices like I do, an iPhone and an iPad, etc., you do have to go through your customization for every device that you have. So maybe iCloud syncing will be something that will be added in future because that would also mean that the Braille support that is now in tvOS, the operating system for the Apple TV, will also benefit from this. But there is enormous configurability and hats off to Apple for doing this. They are also attempting to clean up their Braille input so that it's uh, a little easier to use. You can't insert random things in the middle of documents that expand in a way you weren't expecting. So some very serious attention has been paid to Braille in iOS 11. Okay, Buster. I want to talk about me. Me, 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 me. Oh, my goodness. Opinionated little thing, isn't it? All right, let's talk about some of the new smarts that Siri has. One thing that will be appreciated by many, particularly in an accessibility context for people with a speech impairment, or even if you're in a meeting and you want to ask Siri a question and you can't talk, is that you can now type to Siri. And when you hold down the home button or the side button in the iPhone 10, which is how you get to Siri in the iPhone 10, you will be able to type a question to Siri. And you'll still be able to talk to Siri if you have this set up by using the magic phrase, H-E-Y, 
Siri, and then it will go ahead and uh, and invoke itself. Siri is also supposed to be a bit more context aware than it used to be. So the way this might work is, when was John F. Kennedy born? John F. Kennedy was born May 29, 1917. When did he die? John F. Kennedy died November 22, 1963. How many children did he have? Let me have a look. The children of John F. Kennedy were John F. Kennedy, Jr., Caroline Kennedy, and two more. So it followed along there. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, so you can have a play with this. In languages that support it, one of the really cool things is the translation feature. Let's give you an example, and we'll say, how do you say, good evening, my name is Jonathan, in French? In French, good evening, my name is Jonathan is. Bonsoir, mon nom est Jonathan. There you go. It translated it. And there's a play button on the screen here. How d- in French, good evening, translation, head, English. Good evening, my name is Jonathan. French, play, button. Now, there's the play button. So you can read this in Braille if you have a Braille display connected, if you're learning a language. But if you are out somewhere and you want to have this phrase ready to play to someone, then you just double tap this play button again. Bonsoir, mon nom est Jonathan. Very nice. Let's ask for something practical, like... How do you say, could you direct me to the nearest beer garden, please, in German? In German, could you direct me to the nearest beer garden is... Könntest du mir den kleinen Biergarten zeigen? There you go. You can have a lot of fun with this, and it also works with Mandarin Chinese. So, we can say something like... How do you say, I am giving a presentation over the internet in Chinese? In Mandarin, I am giving a presentation over the internet is... There you go, I am enlightened. I want to cover one more feature. There are so many features, 41,000 words of them in iOS 11 without the I, so we've only just scratched the surface, believe me. But I do want to point out a really cool accessibility assistant that has been built in to the control center. Now, the control center is that thing where you swipe up with three fingers from the status bar. And in the past, it has been fairly static. What is in the control center is what Apple decides should be in the control center. That's all changed now because you can go into control center settings and you can specify a whole bunch of different widgets that you can take in or take out of your own control center to personalize it so that it's useful for you. One of the options includes a nifty little remote for your Apple TV. So without having to download a third-party app or an Apple app from the App Store, you can, in fact, use a remote right in control center for your Apple TV. There is another really cool feature. I'm going to invoke the control center now. Aeroplane mode. Switch button. Off. And there are some features that are static still in Control Center that are pretty essential, like airplane mode, Wi-Fi, cellular data, and of course your media controls as well. The items you can add appear past these static controls. Now, I think the one I want to show you is towards the bottom of this screen. So I'm going to perform a four-finger single tap to get us towards the bottom. Wallet. Button. Use 3D Touch to show more controls. Actions available. I'll flick to the left. Voice. Memos. Button. And the Voice Memos app is something a lot of blind people like to use, so now it's in really easy reach right here from the control center. But here's the cool one. Screen recording. Button. Use 3D Touch to show more controls. Actions available. Screen recording does exactly what it sounds like on the tin. It records your screen. Optionally, with the microphone as well. And Apple very sensibly have ensured that if you do turn your microphone on with this screen recording feature and you are flicking around and you've got voiceover coming through your iPhone or iPad speaker, it will pick up voiceover and record it as part of the screen recording. This is a really big deal in terms of communicating with app developers who have a problem with the accessibility of their app and they care 
but they don't quite understand how a blind person uses voiceover. So let's say you've got an app from the App Store, you've paid a bit of money for it, or it's a free app, but you really want to use it, and there's no other app that quite does what this app does. What you can do now is record yourself using the app. And when you are flicking around the screen with VoiceOver, VoiceOver draws a kind of a rectangle around the item that has focus. And that makes it easy for a sighted person to see where you as a blind person have flicked to on the screen. So what you do is you open the offending app. You go to Control Center because you've added the screen recording item in Control Center like I have. And you turn it on, you double tap to turn it on, and then you start talking. You say, hello, Mr. or Miss App Developer. This is what happens when I, as a blind person, try and use your app. And you flick through it, and it says button, button, button. And they can see what button you're on because you're making a screen recording. You save it, you attach it to an email, and hopefully the app developer is a little wiser about the problem, and they can take action to fix the problem. Those are just a very small number of highlights in iOS 11. The book iOS 11 without the eye goes into a lot of detail. I do hope, and and the feedback I've got is that it is a, a handy resource to help you make sure that you're making the most of what is becoming an increasingly powerful device, not just for content consumption. And we've been consuming content on these things for a long time now, since VoiceOver was introduced to the iPhone 3GS back in 2009. But increasingly, it's becoming more viable for content creation as well. And can I just close by saying how much I am really looking forward to being on your iPhone, iPad and iPod Touch really soon. I know you have enjoyed hearing from me. And thank you for putting up with Jonathan. Give yourself a cookie. Thanks for listening to The Blind Side, a production of Mosin Consulting. On the web at mosin.org.